According to Statistics Canada, intimate partner violence accounts for one quarter of all police reported violent crimes in Canada. Women who are brought from abroad continue to be silenced when they are domestically abused and they live in fear of deportation if they ever speak out against it. He spoke to one of the women's shelters in Calgary, Canada, which help out such victims, especially Muslim women and children. From Lisa Holmes, we have Saima. Saima is Major Gifts and Contributions Manager in Calgary. So Saima, tell us about Lisa Holmes. What's the background? How was it founded? And what was the need of a shelter like Nisa Homes? So Nisa Homes is a project of National Zakat Foundation. National Zakat Foundation uh, helps with uh, educating, uh, collecting and distributing zakat locally in Canada. Um, and Nisa Homes uh, is a project of NZF, as I mentioned. Nisa Homes is a group of transitional homes that help women and children that are fleeing domestic violence, homelessness and poverty. Uh, we typically help women and children that are uh, non-status immigrant refugees or newcomers. When we were looking into opening Nisa Homes, uh, what we found is when uh, immigrant women and uh, Muslim women, when they're trying to uh, access mainstream shelters, uh, there are barriers that they face, whether it's cultural barriers, uh, barriers to language, barriers to getting getting uh, the kind of food that they need, barriers to be able to practice their own, uh, you know, uh, uh, their spiritual needs, where, where, whether it's observing hijab, uh, having access to halal food, being able to pray during Ramadan, having access to suhoor and iftar. Uh, those things were really challenging for them. Also, a lot of times, uh, mainstream shelters are co-ed, and that doesn't work for a lot of our Muslim clients as well. And not just Muslim clients, even other uh, uh, ladies from other cultures, they don't prefer living in a co-ed environment. And so that's where, our, but that's where we saw the need. And and having said that, um, just the rates of domestic violence uh, in the Muslim population and other cultural uh, populations is significantly increasing over the years. And that is coming from. So Nisa Homes came about in about 2015 and we started out in uh, Mississauga in, in the GTA. And then since then we've been able to um, have seven homes across Canada. So at this point we're at seven homes. Uh, we are in, uh, uh, we have four homes. So we have Mississauga. Uh, Scarborough, Windsor and Ottawa in Ontario. We have one in Surrey and in Alberta we have one in Calgary and Edmonton and we're just looking into expanding into Montreal. Montreal? Yeah. Okay. yeah. So my next question is, uh, is it only for women and is it only for Muslim women? So primarily we serve Muslim women because there's nothing specifically for Muslim women. Having said that, if there's ever a client who needs help and they're not Muslim and we have space in our homes, we don't turn people away. Okay. Um, so we would rather help people than have empty beds in our homes, right? So uh, while we give priority to Muslim women, we also help people from other culture. And yes, it is for women and their children. Uh, there are no men in the homes. And how is it funded? Uh, so up until, I want to say, right before COVID, we were all privately funded through donations from the community from all of our different cities. But alhamdulillah, during COVID, we were able to get some COVID-specific grants. And this year, uh, inshallah, we're looking to look some more into government funding so that we can be more sustainable uh, and we can open more homes in more cities uh, throughout Canada, inshallah. And how is it run? Uh, like people like yourself, uh, do people volunteer here? Usually we have staff in the homes. Um, I myself, I'm a major gifts and contributions manager. So I take care of uh, the grant side of things uh, for Nisa Homes and uh, National Zakat Foundation. Uh, but usually in a home, so say for example in Calgary, we have an operations manager who takes care of the entire operations of the home. But we also have case workers in the home who work one-on-one -on -one directly with the clients. Along with that, we also have like a wellness counselor uh, that does art therapy and group therapy sessions and one-on-one -on -one sessions with the clients. And we have childcare workers in the home that uh, try to do activities and uh, some therapy sessions with uh, the children as well. And as for the volunteers piece, while we all all our staff are uh, paid, uh, paid staff. We do have volunteers and I don't think we would exist without the help of our volunteers. Uh, we typically have volunteers that help with, uh, this. so there'll be some volunteers who'll come into the home that'll help with like babysitting, doing some workshops with the women and children. But during COVID, so the entire last year, we haven't had the opportunity to have many uh, volunteers at the home, obviously due to restrictions that were imposed. Um, having said that, outside of the home, we also have uh, volunteers that help us with events, with outreach, uh, 
setting up booths in, our, in other places, you know, collecting donations, managing donations. So our volunteers play a very key role in our organization and without them we would not be successful. So we're really grateful for that community and for that support. Uh, just COVID has been really tr tricky with navigating that piece because our events were shut down, couldn't have volunteers in the home. But inshallah, in, in the next few months, we're looking forward to revamping that and uh, bringing volunteers back into our homes. So how do people or victims contact you? Um, for someone fleeing from domestic violence, how do they find you? Uh, so we get a lot of our uh, referrals from other shelters because shelters typically have a shorter stay for up to three weeks and that's not enough to kind of sort a lot of the issues that are going on or to get them onto welfare and find a place of their own. So we get a lot of referrals from settlement agencies, from um, other shelters, from uh, we also get calls from community members. Uh, but if you want to self-refer as well, there's always an opportunity to do that. You can give us a call at our uh, number, which is one 693 And for each city, we have a different extension. Um, and so you would call that. Uh, we would... Uh, well, we would uh, kind of do an, a quick little uh, brief uh, call and figure out if we're able to help you. Um, we can also go on our website where we have a form that you can fill out um, and we will contact you within 24 hours to see how we can help you. So uh, does Nisa Home accept donations and how can people donate? So uh, yes, we do accept donations and like I mentioned initially, uh, we are run by donations. So if you want to donate monetarily to us, uh, you can uh, do that by our website, uh, which is www.nisahomes.com. Uh, but if you want to volunteer uh, like in kind items or your time, uh, please reach out to us. Um, um, for uh, the donation items, uh, we do have to check if that's something we need because we have very limited storage in our homes. Um, so uh, we typically have to see what it is that we can take, but we usually need to accept uh, gently used uh, uh, household items. Clothing, not as much, unless we have a client in the home needing those things, then we will uh, take uh, clothing items, but we don't uh, particularly take clothing items uh, in general. But yes, uh, and as Ramadan is coming up, um, we are def definitely uh, collecting our donations. Uh, we are a zakatable project, so you can pay our zakat towards Nisa Homes. We are also a charitable organization, so you will get tax receipts for your uh, donations. Um, and we have a lot of programs and a lot of uh, fun things planned during Ramadan. So please engage with us through our social media pages and through all the programs that we are planning for Ramadan, inshallah. What happens when a victim comes in? What's the process and what resources you guys have access to and do you provide legally? So typically when a client uh, calls us and says, hey, I need help, we will We'll, uh, call them back to an intake it's usually about 30 to 45 minutes and it's a pretty extensive intake uh, what we're trying to get is what their needs what the clients needs are um, and also to make sure that uh, we are able to accommodate their needs so because we are a transitional home uh, we are unable to take uh, anybody who has any uh, dr uh, dr substance use or alcohol use uh, also we're not able to accommodate for anybody who has any mental health needs uh, we don't have the staff currently to accommodate accommodate those needs currently so we have to kind of screen those things before we bring clients in once they go to the screening process once a client comes in uh, they can stay with us for up to three months during which we'll pair them up with a caseworker um, and the caseworker will one work one-on-one -on -one with them to first they'll start off with a needs assessment where they'll go through like a thorough A to Z of what what is it that they need whether it's employment or job or housing or legal aid whatever it is that they need and then they'll come up with like a timeline to see how this is what we're gonna work on and this is what the timeline is gonna look like for the three months that you're gonna be staying here so they will uh, the caseworker will meet with the client every week uh, have casework meetings at the same time the client will also meet with the social uh, with the uh, mental health counselor who will do counseling sessions with them um, and yes yeah, for legal aid uh, if that's a need that's recognized in the needs assessment we'll definitely go and help them fill out those applications and we have some uh, lawyers that we work with typically and we'll try to as long as they are able to get approved through legal aid we're able to refer them to those lawyers and uh, get uh, get them the help that they need when it comes to uh, the other kind of applications when it comes to housing we'll kind of connect them with uh, second stage housing we'll help them fill out those applications calgary housing so subsidi subsidized housing applications will help them with those we'll connect them with landlords that we work with and if they you know help them kind of uh, coach them as to how to have a conversation with a landlord so that comes with the housing piece when it comes to employment we'll do some mock interviews we can help them with resume writing or just editing uh, kind of show them how to look for jobs and how to use the different mediums that are there to, uh, to look for jobs whether it's indeed or you know marketplace whatever it is that they can um, and uh, when it comes to uh, link classes or education piece again we'll try to connect them with uh, we'll refer them to other agencies who are able to take them on and we work in collaboration with all these other agencies within the city right so if, if there's a service that we feel that we're not able to provide we will connect them with other uh, services uh, other organizations that are 
able to uh, meet those needs for them. Um, we've also helped clients with immigration issues in the sense that we'll help them fill out those extensive applications from the government, um, uh, health cards, uh, social assistance forms, uh, all of that stuff. We, we, it's, it's a very holistic and encompassing uh, uh, service that we provide. What kind of cases do you see the most? Um, so it's interesting you ask that because it's it's never one kind of case, right? There's it's layers upon layers of issues that one client is dealing with. So yes, there's domestic violence, but also then they're tied to immigration issues. And with those immigration issues, then there are also legal issues that come in, right? So it's it's very it's not it's not just one issue. It's not not just domestic violence that comes through. And and then we recognize like living in Cal in Canada, we we are recognizing there's also Islamophobia and, and uh, new new rewards that are facing. You know, they're, either they're getting uh, asked to leave their homes, uh, so they, they need a place to uh, to go, and they come to us. And we have those clients as well. So we see poverty, we see homelessness, we see domestic violence, we see non-status clients because. They don't have any immigration uh, status. We see new reverts and people who are facing Islamophobia as well. How did COVID affect Nisa Homes? Um, so COVID uh, has been interesting. Uh, it's been an up and down with COVID just because initially we were asked to reduce our capacities just to maintain our social distancing. And then it was relaxed, not necessarily relaxed, but it was comparatively relaxed. Uh, 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 compared to when it initially hit and then we had to go back and uh, uh, you know have those uh, restrictions again in terms of the capacity of our homes or so the capacity within our homes were uh, reduced and so it kind of limited uh, how many clients we could help uh, we also had to come up with new protocols to um, keep the women and children in our homes safe uh, because it's a communal living area we are very typical looking home uh, clients share most of the common areas whether it's a kitchen or the bathroom to the dining room the living room they share those spaces uh, so we had to come up with uh, new protocols for the clients uh, so that we can keep everybody safe it was definitely tough it was tough for clients because they really like that community feeling that they get when they're able to kind of lean in on those other clients and you know build those relationships with clients uh, it was it was it was difficult for the both the women and the uh, children but it's been an up and down We've definitely seen an increased number of uh, calls come through. I think it's more than doubled uh, during the last eight to ten months. And during these COVID times, do you see more women coming in due to issues like domestic violence or they were let go from workplace because of gender inequality or they had to be at home with the kids and they suffered? Um, I think we've seen a combination of all of that that you mentioned. Um, it's uh, I, I don't know if you've heard, but domestic violence uh, and intimate partner violence is being labeled as a shadow pandemic to COVID-19. Um, and that's because um, what, what's happened is uh, the women and children that are trying to flee these situations, they're now in proximity uh, uh, of their uh, perpetrators for a lot longer, right? So where they would get periods of break where the perpetrator would go to work or periods of break when they would go to school, they're not getting that because they're always around, right? And so that has been really difficult. And what's uh, what's also happened is job losses and just stress and anxiety that has led to more incidents of more incidents and more um, more intensity in the violence that these women and children are facing. Um, and the other thing is, uh, it's been tricky. It's been tricky to safety plan with these clients when they come to us and say, hey, because they don't have an opportunity to leave the home safely because they're always around. The perpetrator is always around. So that has been a tricky part for us to navigate as well as to find a pocket of time where they're able to safely exit from their homes. Saima, do you want to share a success story with us? Please? Yes, of course. So uh, this is about a woman. She, she came here with her husband uh, after getting married. Uh, she had a daughter with her. Uh, but uh, at one point, uh, she didn't have any status in Canada, so she was said that you need to go back to your country uh, so to, to get the status. You need to re-enter for that, you need to go back. Except when she went back, uh, she was asked to leave uh, her daughter with the husband when she was here. Um, and uh, when she came back into the country, uh, he was nowhere to be found and the daughter was gone as well um, and eventually she had to get the police involved and she was alhamdulillah she was able to find her daughter and she was able to get her daughter back except um, she also was pregnant with another child at that time um, she had nowhere to go she had no status in canada she shelter hopped uh, during her entire pregnancy she delivered a child in a shelter um, and she was without a status for over two over two years um, she eventually won ramadan when uh, when she was talking to her caseworker at whichever shelter she was at she reached out and she said 
said, you know, I really can't fast because I'm not getting the meals that I'm supposed to at, at four o'clock in the morning because most of the shelters, they have uh, a time, a cutoff time that you get the meals. And so she wasn't able to fast and she must have addressed it with her caseworker or counselor there. And they reached out to us and we had just newly opened at that point. Uh, so they reached out to us. We were able to, alhamdulillah, take her in. Uh, she stayed with us. We were able to help her uh, connect her with the lawyer for that immigration piece. Uh, we were able to um, uh, help her with her legal issues to connect her with the lawyer even for her custody and uh, child support. Uh, alhamdulillah, now uh, she has moved out into her own home with the support of our caseworkers and our counselor, uh, counselors at Nisa Homes. And uh, she is now uh, living on her own with her children. Her children are now attending childcare or daycare and preschool. And uh, she is actively looking for work. She's working part time and actively looking for a full time job. And she has status in Canada now, alhamdulillah, as well. So do you have a message for women, uh, especially for women who are brought in here from abroad and uh, you know, who get married or the daughters, you know, who are... Uh so I, I don't have a message specifically for women or daughters. I think I have a message for everybody. And that is... Um, Domestic violence is very rampant in our communities and we cannot solve it until we address the root causes of domestic violence. And we can't do that unless we start having these conversations within our families. And they're not easy conversations, they're very taboo in our cultures. But unless we address that, unless we talk about healthy relationships, uh, not not just between spouses, but also between parents and ch parent and ch child, uh, we will not be able to solve this issue. As for people who are being brought into the country, uh, know your rights, you know, know your rights. Uh, I, I know a lot of clients that we get, they live in fear that they're going to get deported if they, you know, take action against what they're facing. But know your rights. You know, there's a lot of organizations that will tell you what those rights are. Reach out to us, reach out to other settlement agencies, and they will be there. And no, you're not going to get deported. So reach out. And if you need to leave, leave.